The world of darkness hosts a great number of supernatural creatures, who seek refuge in a diverse range of habitats. The mighty Garu, known more commonly to mortals as werewolves, roam the vast natural landscapes, from forests to mountains, fending off any soul who threatens their territory. Wraiths may traverse the Shadowlands, treading that liminal boundary between life and the great beyond. Many creatures, however, live amongst humans, shrouding their very form to blend in with the masses. Vampires have made this practice part of their core existence. For vampires, blending in with the great hordes of kine is not only an important factor in preserving their own life, but also for their own sustenance. Mortals are food, and where more humans live, you can bet that covens of canites will flock to those hubs, in the pursuit of either satiating their vitae fueled appetites, or through their desire to manipulate the masses for their own sadistic pleasures. Urban areas have thus become the center of vampire society, and are hotly contested between vampiric factions, or even singular vampires hoping to stake out their street as their own personal hunting ground. There have been many cities throughout the millennia of vampiric existence that have hosted some of the most climactic events in the history of these bloodsuckers, but many are simply huge hives of mortal feeding stocks, stacked as high as the sky's limit, and ripe for the picking. Tonight, we will be traversing the globe, investigating these cities which are infested with vampires. The cities tonight are ones which are steeped in bloody history, from the epicenters of great vampiric empires to the sites of scenes which are plucked from your most terrifying of nightmares. And if you're lucky, perhaps even your own little piece of Mother Earth may be mentioned tonight. But first, if you enjoy grim tales from dark universes or want to learn more about the world of darkness, perhaps leave a like or even subscribe as it helps the channel immensely. The parasitic relationship between vampires and humans is a well-documented one, which spans back to the very first vampire, the Dark Father Cain. It was Cain who, in his loneliness, cursed to only find nutrition from the blood of humanity, left the desolate lands of Nod to seek shelter within the First City, a civilization inhabited by the mortal progeny of Seth, Eve's third child. There, Cain was heralded as a divine being, as the cursed mark bestowed upon him by God made many within that settlement revere him as a deity. Cain's first childer was sired here, in the city which would become known as Enoch, named after the settlement's king and Cain's first child. As such, cities within Vampire the Masquerade are far more important than simple domiciles. Within Nodist belief, the vampiric world begins and ends with the founding of cities, being that of Enoch and then finally Gehenna. Cities are the very foundations upon which vampiric society survives off of, as the ranks of Cainite sects are almost exclusively preserved in city hubs. Vampires who are nomadic or secluded in nature are revered as lower in these vicious social circles, and sometimes the only way to heighten your status within the society is to play into the debauchery and etiquette of urban vampiric existence. However, these cities are oftentimes highly regulated areas when it comes to population control. Within the Dark Ages, it was mandated that there could only be one vampire for every 1,000 mortals within a civilization, mainly due to the dwindling supplies and the tendency for mortals within this era to meet an untimely fate without any vampiric influence involved. This rule was also primarily maintained to ensure that vampires could hunt with near impunity. It was rare for a vampire during this time to encounter another undead soul within a city street, and thus battles of turf were not common outside of major political shifts or crises. Through the passage of time and the drastic bloat of the human population causing cities to become gargantuan in both size and density, the rules enforced by the Camarilla, the dominant force within the vampire world, recalculated the ratio to one vampire per 100,000 mortals. This is a figure which is extremely troublesome to maintain, and whilst the masquerade and traditions keep this ratio somewhat stable, the increasing numbers of mortals have caused cities to become breeding grounds for vampire brood. Cities are no longer simple fortifications which provide safety and food, they are tools for control, 
often exerted by the most powerful of elder vampires, claiming them as their domain. This leads to some of the most brutal events which play out within the world of vampires to this present night. Whilst the Camarilla rulers attempt to maintain the populations of kindred, sects such as the Sabbat and even the Anarchs often inflate the numbers of vampires within a city, feeding into the conflict within this undead society known as the Eternal Struggle. Whilst vampires have dedicated the best part of a millennia to perfecting their urban societies, with ever-growing numbers of embraced kindred the scales have begun to shift within the 21st century. Some cities have become hotbeds for mass sirings, and creations of new vampiric brood which are made outside of the Camarilla's authority. These new Cainites, often uninformed of the world of darkness around them, draw the attention of societies and organisations who have trained for years perfecting the art of hunting their kind. Being a vampire within a modern city is almost akin to a prison sentence. It is the only place you can exist, but it is almost certainly the very ground where your ashes will be scattered as the morning sun dawns. Here are some cities which are steeped in both historical and present significance. These are cities which have become notorious within the world of darkness for harbouring some of the most infamous vampires and many events which are retold night after night. Our first city comes from antiquity. Known in modern times as Istanbul, the city has always remained a prominent hub for vampiric activity due to its geography. As a key city which unites both the western and eastern communities of Canaanites, it has often been the epicentre of Camarilla political intrigue primarily through the influence of Clan Toreador, which have maintained their influence over the princes of this patch of domain since the Ottomans have laid claim over the settlement. However, there are various elements within Istanbul which hark back to an older, more ancient time, where the city was primarily revered as the foundations of a utopia for the undead, orchestrated by three immensely powerful elders, Childa, of antediluvians. Poetically speaking, Constantinople within the world of darkness is revered by vampire kind to be modelled after the great Canaanite cities of Rome and Carthage. This new utopia was special for many reasons. Not only was it an abundant feeding ground, but it was a vital refuge for the Canaanites who found themselves without a haven after the fall of Rome. The three who would take on the mantle of being the founders of this utopia in Constantine's new Rome would come to call themselves the Triumvirate, inspired by Christian doctrine, each taking upon the roles of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It was their mission to create a heaven for their kind, a so-called dream that would last an eternity, in correlation with the immortality they faced through vampirism. The three in question were Michael, the Toreador, Dracon, the Zamishi, and Antonius, the Ventru. The three were very much intertwined in each other's paths long before the city was founded. Though as one city fell, these three great thinkers of vampire society would see Constantinople as a perfect fit to enact their grand design for the future of their kind. It is important to note that these three were not simply strong comrades, but more so lovers to a degree which would spell out a fatal flaw in their eternal plan. Michael, the one who initially united the triumvirate, was the one who would transform Constantinople into the beauty it would soon become, and endure for centuries under his tentative watch. Between him stood two opposing sides of this messy love triangle. The father, Antonius, was known for his practical mind, keeping order through manipulating the passing great rulers and emperors of his time. On the other side was the Draken, an Obertus Zumishi who reveled in change. Not so much the Zumishi desire to change oneself, but to meld the functions of the world around him, primarily through the workings of the monastic order he oversaw. He personally saw in Michael the opportunity to realise this fully, yet was consistently rebutted by the other lover. Michael enjoyed this sense of competition between his lovers, so much so that it would develop in more drastic ways, spiralling into a catastrophe which would demolish the dream, leaving only sprawling broods of their side 
inside Childa to reassemble the pieces. The events which led up to the fragmentation of Constantine's so-called utopia were mired in political turmoil and pestilence. It was initially Antonius who utilised his sway with the great rulers, primarily the Thrace Justin, against the Zamishi, striking at the very religious institutions upon which the Draken and Zamishi brood used for shelter. Dracon, in return, sought to destroy the very stability Antonius upheld, unleashing an outbreak of the bubonic plague to cause the eventual downfall of his political network. Michael, blinded by his own egotism, thought he could amend the infighting between his lovers by gifting them two potential children, Simeon and Gesu. The two boys were twins, being merely seven years old at the time of their adoption, and were each raised by Antonius and Dracon. As the boys grew under their tutelage, Dracon was sent a message from his sire, the elusive eldest, to never embrace his potential child, Gesu, fearing that his child was a portent. Disregarding the words of the Antediluvian, Dracon sired Gesu, hammering the first nail in the fall of Constantinople's dream. Gesu fell into a two-year-long torpor, with his brother Simeon waiting at his side, despite Antonius's plea to leave him. It is said when Gesu awoke, he had an angelic vision. This vision took the form of an embrace, and with Simeon at his side, the brother sighed his kin into the Zamishi clan, robbing Antonius of his promised child. Enraged by this, Antonius sought retribution, blaming the Dracon for this act of utter betrayal. Unable to quell the rage of his lover, Michael himself began to spiral into an ever-sickening madness, watching as his lovers sought to tear each other asunder. Antonius called for a vampiric iconoclasm, condemning the blood worship of the Zamishi and to have them put to the final death. It would be in 796 AD when the dream would finally meet its end. Opposition to the iconoclasm came in many forms. Forms. Many came from monasteries of the Zamishi and the ranks of Michael's own, but some Ventru also joined their side and conspired to end the reign of Antonius. Caius, one of Antonius's childer, was eager to fulfil the deed, and after the body of Antonius was left to dust by the hand of his own child, Caius would assume the role of Constantinople's order in his sire's place. This was not meant to last. For the Dracon, this event spelled the end of the utopia the Triumvirate had made, and one night he would slip into the shadows, with his memory persisting amongst the revenant families of the Obertus Zamishi. Michael's madness grew ever more relentless, so much so that he took to isolating himself within the Hagia Sophia, believing himself to be an angel, and believing that this dream to bring heaven to vampires on earth was not only real, but realized in holy divinity. The Childer of the Triumvirate, Caius, Gesu, Simeon, and Petronius, Michael's only child exempt from his psychic torment, gradually reformed the city. Yet, it is but a shadow of what it was. Constantinople, for vampire kind, no longer resembles that of a dream, but yet another hive of mortals to prey upon and utilize for their ever more bitter schemes. Chicago is, in many ways, the most iconic city within the world of darkness. On the surface, it is America's third largest city, boasting a modest population of some two and a half million souls. It is a place which has been both defined by its sense of industry, but also its indulgence in luxury and opulence. It is, for vampires of all kinds, the perfect settlement, especially for those who want to ensnare it with the tendrils of the ivory tower. And as such, the vampiric politics of Chicago have turned the city into a veritable playground of infighting, power struggles and Byzantine politics. Similar to Istanbul, Chicago is situated perfectly within North America, as a convergence point of travel for much of the Midwest. The sprawling metropolitan area of the city also drains influence from other urban areas, with the vampires of Milwaukee, Gary, and various other towns and hubs of mortal activity around Lake Michigan often using Chicago as their go-to spot to conduct business or otherwise appease the great political structures the Camarilla have built in the city. A notorious location within the vampiric world is the Succubus Club, which was founded within Chicago and has since grown in acclaim from being the very site where a Methuselah was buried underneath to a battleground between lupines and vampires alike. In stark contrast 
to many notorious cities within vampiric control, Chicago is deemed as a fairly new settlement. It can take years of tentative street battles, backstabbings, and coups to fully take control of a city. But Chicago's first prince only claimed praxis in 1837, serving roughly four decades as the Camarilla head in the city until his brutal deposition on Devil's Night in 1871. However, underneath the politics and chaos of Chicago's surface lurks the deep veins of an ancient threat, which has loomed over the vampiric world since the time of Cain. It could be said that the true power which resides within Chicago is held by ancient vampires, primarily the two opposing forces of Menelaus, the Bruja Methuselah and former King of Sparta, and Helena, a woman known as the most beautiful in the world and also Toreador Methuselah by Diablery, after draining her hated sire, King Minos. There is much to say about Menele and Helena, but in relation to Chicago, all you must know is that Helena and Menele have been at each other's throats for millennia, after Helena aided the destruction of Carthage for her own survival by bargaining with the Ventru-influenced forces of Rome. Their battle would persist across the ages. Helena's promised domain from Rome in Pompeii would become Menelaus' site of destruction, utilizing a failed thaumaturgical ritual, resulting in the cataclysm brought on by Mount Vesuvius. Though with both surviving, they would continue to fight back and forth until Menelaus left the continent after being dealt a grievous wound by Helena in Spain. Menelaus had left for the New World changing his name and taking upon the title of the Pale Wolf. Menele is considered one of the first Cainites to settle in the New World, and found himself making ties with the native mortal populations, starting with the Mayans and the Incas, and pushing northwards as European colonial expansion wiped out the populations he sought to befriend. This was widely believed to be under Helena's influence, as she continued her hunt against her Methuselah adversary. It would be in the late 18th century that Menele would begin working closely with the Salk leader, Blackhawk, and was tasked with the military training of his people to defend themselves against the expansionist threat. Helena, having tracked Menele through the powers of Auspex, had already devised her own stratagem, using the vampiric powers of Dominate to compel the American forces pushing west to conduct horrific raids near Menele's influence. It would be in 1812 where a midnight cavalry raid, under Helena's orders, would compel the Pale Wolf to enter a dread frenzy. It was said that when Helena entered that gruesome plain, the battle between the two Methuselah caused the very air to turn red. With Menele frenzied and Helena emboldened by her desire to end her eternal enemy, the battle soon became a massacre. The duel itself is described less as a battle of arms and martial prowess, but that of a tornado of vampiric power. A whirlwind consumed them, shredding organic matter to the bone, raining blood across the warpath they both trod. In a desperate effort, Effort to send Menele to his final death, Helena drove her claws into his ribcage, causing the ancient vampire to howl out in a death-defying scream. However, forced on by his urge for revenge, Menele drove forth his skull into her own, causing the two to disengage, both brutally injured. Some of Menele's allies made a desperate attempt to recover his body. However, the final blow would come from Helena's ghoul, Prius, who drove an embered stake deep into Menelae's neck, sending him into torpor. Both ancient vampires were eventually recovered from the scene, both drifting into this long sleep. Though whilst their bodies were immobilized, their souls were very much awake, and as they lay in a state much like death, they called forth their forces to that place, in the city that would become known as Chicago. As the tale goes between the two ancients, power within Chicago is constantly shifting, and near the turn of the millennium, it was uncovered that the deposition of Prince Maxwell and the rise of Loden was conceived by the blood ties of these Methuselah, using ancient powers within their torpor to manipulate the entire city, creating chaos and anarchy from their own grave-like states. The City of London, before it was plunged into turmoil by the Second Inquisition, was an equally dreary place. The London of the world of darkness was a constant cesspit of constant violence on the streets, dereliction, and urban decay. The vampires of London, at one point, were esteemed rulers, in a land cultivated by the powerful Methuselah Mithras, the so-called Prince of Avalon, but in modern times it is a hive of kindred who constantly tear at each other's throats. The Prince of London, the once seneschal to Mithras, Queen Anne Boersley, is a kindred fixed on what you could call 
call self-improvement. By self-improvement, she has been allowed to lower her generation once through Diablery, but has constantly sought out more power from this act as the years tick on. Her ferocity has accommodated her some security within her domain. Queen Anne is not one to shy away from frequent blood hunting, to weasel out traitors, conspirators, or even just miscreants that would otherwise threaten her praxis. Her reputation as the Bulldog of London is earned, even if it is through the constant bloodshed of her own peers. As the clans of London constantly scramble for power, the city has become somewhat of a ground zero for new movements and old, with the Anarchs growing their ranks and the Sabat taking the opportunity to use the city as a recruitment opportunity, taking advantage of the many young vampires ripe for indoctrination. The history of Knights within London, and as an extension, the whole of the British Isles, is one which links back to the extremely notorious vampire known as Mithras, the Prince of Light. A tale we'll tell tonight as a summary, but we will certainly recover in another installment. Mithras, like other ancient vampires who have chosen to influence entire cities within their unlife, grew his foundations throughout the ancient world. Born in Persia, rising the ranks of militaristic leadership, he constantly impressed the world with his tactical intuition. He fought many battles in his time winning through strategy, wit, and unconventional tactics. It was his prerogative to make warfare and diplomacy a game. Games he was well experienced in winning. Mithras's first experience of London was through travelling to the great Canite city of Rome where he gained insight into the Eternal Senate, a council of elders which mirrored the Senate of Rome, yet often remained turbulent due to the constant infighting of the gluttonous ancient vampires, which sought to rule from it. Being a soldier at heart, Mithras chose to accompany the Roman legions as they conquered Western Europe. It pleased him to witness such battles wage across the world, but it would be in Britain where he felt at home. The battles fought between the legions and the barbarians which flowed perpetually across the isles were intriguing to him, and he intermingled with both the settling Roman Canites and the Canites of Celtic Britain. He established a haven near the River Walbrook, known as the Mithraeum, and often hosted some of the most famous vampires of history, most notably the presence of the antediluvian Hakim. Though Mithras enjoyed his settlement in London, torpor would come for him as it comes for many Methuselah across the centuries. And after being wounded in one of the many vampiric civil wars which are fought across the ancient world, the wounded Mithras would enter a sleep that would last until the Normans conquered what would then become England. Mithras's legacy as Prince of Avalon, commanding the baronies of the British Isles, is a tale stricken with immortal battles with Egyptian kings, wars with Lupin pines, and mysterious sabbat conspiracies, many elements which I will save for their own video another night. So do keep an eye out for an instalment all about the unliving god, Mithras. Mexico City, or Distrito Federal, is by many considered the spiritual home of the vampiric sect known as the Sabbat. With a population in the world of darkness of 17 million souls spread across 571 square miles, it is considered by many within vampire society as an uncontrollable city. Many have tried to conquer Mexico City, and many have failed. But the Sabbat have used the nature of the land to its advantage. With its rich cultural history and diverging beliefs, with many being rooted in ancient practices spanning back to the Mayans and the Aztecs, it is a city of many contrasts, and various lucrative opportunities for any would-be vampire who believes themselves brave enough to walk the streets at night. 500 vampires roam Mexico City. Some would even call it completely infested with shovelheads and sabat packs alike. Lawlessness is a feature that many sabat prefer, and leads to an unlife which feels uninhibited. They can tear down the streets, feed from whoever they please, and be gone without many stirring or alerting those that would hunt them down outside of the masquerade. It is a gory heaven on earth for these vampiric jackals, who use the higher crime rate within the city to obfuscate their nefarious exploits. The first vampire who was recorded in the area of what is now Mexico was a Canite known as Huitzilopochtli, a Bali Methuselah who also went by the name of Shaitan. The Aztecs revered him as a god of war, and standing at eight foot tall, with an exterior which resembled that of an abominable demon, he was deified by the Aztecs. 
and allowed them to settle as a warrior people, founding the city of Tenochtitlan. However, this land was one of not one singular old god, but three. This place was fought over by these entities of darkness, Shaitan being the demonic flame, Tezcatlipoca being the epitome of oblivion, and Quetzalcoatl being the essence of wraith. When the Spaniards invaded the Americas, bringing with them the first Canite settlers in years, many of the Sabat that first landed came across these entities, many believing them to be antediluvian in nature. Some had come into contact with these beings, mainly the regent-to-be Melinda Galbraith, who travelled with her sire Helena to Mexico, and was abducted by Shaitan, yet also aided him from being destroyed by the oncoming Sabat horde. The Sabat's position on such matters of ancient vampires is definitive, and thus violent conflict arose as both sides attempted to force the other out of Mexico. The betrayer of the Tremere, Goratrix, was supposedly the one who destroyed Tezcatlipoca, who was utilising the powers of oblivion to warp the La Sombra's own disciplines, turning them against their users. It was said that in 1691, this deity utilised its powers of obtenebration to blot out the sun, and manifested shadowy tendrils to spear many La Sombra in their havens. Goratrix, in reaction to this, was said to have concocted a cauldron of blood, using the entity's ica. But there is no concrete evidence of the being's destruction, only the word of the traitorous mage, and also the fact that it has not hunted since. A century prior, a Knight led invasion by Hernan Cortez saw Shaitan put into torpor, after the capital of the Aztecs was brutally sacked. In the wake of the pillaging, the temple of Huitzilopochtli was put to the flame, which supposedly sent the ancient vampire into torpor, creating the space for the new world to be colonised by the Spanish. The Sabat that ventured into Mexico saw the founding of the city, which soon grew into a large colonial settlement. The La Sombra, which took the head of the operation, saw to it to control the church and the clergy, attempting to force some form of order over their operations. However, as gold and silver were found on the continent, a mad rush of would-be colonisers flooded the land, with many vampires under the banner of the Camarilla entering the city, and thus turf wars broke out, and the city began to switch control back and forth. Civil wars did not aid the Sabat's position in Mexico. The Camarilla, through their usage of ghouls within the silver trade, secured a stable foothold in those early days. However, after the Purchase Pact which ended the first Sabat civil war, the regent Gorkist made it known that Mexico City would become Sabat domain, and the Black Heart Part of the movement. Gorkist oversaw, through the years of battle against the Camarilla, that Mexico City would remain in the hands of the Sword of Cain, utilising the Black Hand, the militaristic wing of the sect, to secure its borders, and maintain security away from the clutches of the Ivory Tower. Mexico City within the most modern era is one now controlled by the new elite of the Camarilla, primarily the neonate Fiorenza Savona, a woman typified by her Machiavellian demeanour, her control all over the city relies on the manipulation of the mortals who occupy it. Yet, with a city so vast and populated, it may not be long until another sect capitalises on the persisting uncontrollable features, and topples it back down into the perfect anarchic state it once was. Tokyo, Japan is the largest city on Earth, taking into account its urban area population of some 39 million people. It could only be assumed that vampires must occupy the vast stocks of mortals, but the history of Tokyo within vampiric circles is an odd one. Japan, in the grander scope of the world of darkness, is historically the domain of a vampire-adjacent creature known as the Kuei Jin, or kindred of the East. They are not linked to Cainites in terms of Vitae, but are in many ways similar to vampires. Vampires have been allowed to take residence within Tokyo, despite the isolationist outlook from both the mortal populations and the Kuei Jin. But the Giovanni have occupied a haven within Ginza under the protection of the Gaki. Some vampires have made the journey to Tokyo without the protection of the Kuei Jin, and have even set up enterprises and societies which operate under the mask of foreign endeavours, such as import companies and foreign trade groups. The Tremere Preston Varick is 
one such example, but he has consistently had to battle against the Kuei Jin and criminal syndicates such as the Yakuza to maintain his chantry and regency, under strict orders from Vienna. There have been reports of the Bruja also setting out to uncover more about supernatural existence within Asia, yet these are divided into two groups, constantly at each other's throats. Tokyo is, however, a very interesting city when it comes to the modern world of Vampire the Masquerade. Recently, the Kuei Jin hold little to no prominence, but in the wake of the Second Inquisition, the city could offer a new sanctuary for vampires who are being shunned in both Europe and the Americas. It is said that there is an odd atmosphere in the city, and when a vampire strays out into the vast swarming crowds of mortals within the Tokyo streets, they feel their insatiable lust for blood dampen significantly. Leadership of the city is ambiguous, but a notable old clan Zamishi, Mayumi Shibasaki, is said to hold a great deal of political weight within the area. She has kept order and received tribute for her role in Tokyo for some time, and even though she is of the 12th generation, she marks a prominent shift in the vampiric politics of the city, especially for Camarilla interests. Tokyo, in my eyes, is a city which deserves to be analysed more within this ever-developing world of darkness. Whilst the old guard are shifting, it would be interesting to see what new things crop up in the city, and what the foreign interests of the Camarilla have in mind for such a highly populated area. Cities are the life blood of vampires, and tonight we're just a few examples. If you want to see more cities featured in these lore videos, do let me know below. There are many cities across the world of darkness, which have been shaped by the machinations of supernaturals, so who knows, maybe next time we will visit an infested city near you, and delve into the nefarious plots orchestrated by these beings who crave to manipulate the masses at large. Thank you for watching, I had a lot of fun with this video. It allowed me to embrace a few parts of VTM lore which I haven't gone over in a long time, and it was great re-exploring them for this video. If you enjoyed this instalment, please feel free to let me know what you liked in the comments below, or if I missed anything, also feel free to tell me, as it does help these videos improve in the long run. I hope to expand on this video by going over some key figures similar to the Dracula video, but for now, stay safe, and remember, do not wander naively into the night.